Welcome to The Tell with Christine Axmith. Today, we're talking with an expert on gangs, and we're going to be comparing the cult indoctrination and exit process with that of gangs. And so with that, I would like to welcome Lisa Taylor Austin. Hi, Lisa. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got into this area? Sure. Um, first off, thank you for having me here. I'm Lisa Taylor Austin, and I am a psychotherapist, but I'm also a expert witness on the topic of criminal street gangs. And I testify in cases across the United States in criminal, civil, and uh, other, other venues. And how I got into this was uh, back in the 1980s, I was hired as a therapist to work at a school. And when I got to that school, they said, your clientele are all gang members. And you're only going to be working with 200 gang members at this school. And I thought, wow, this is interesting. I don't have experience in this. I wonder what made them think I could do this. It's kind of funny because they said to me, you're from New York, you'll be fine. With these young people who were between the ages of 14 and 21, and they were all gang members. And so what I decided to do was just use my really good counseling skills that I had from, uh, from my master's program and establish relationship and rapport with them and get them to educate me. So that's what I did initially. And because I was able to earn their trust, they did educate me a lot about their lifestyle and the way they do things and that kind of thing. Later, maybe about eight years later, I got a phone call out of the blue from an attorney at the Oklahoma Indigent Defense System who said, hey, I hear you're counseling gang members, and I have a habeas corpus case here, and I, I need your help. I can't pay you, but will you please help me? And I said, sure. So when we were done with that, she said, you know, you were invaluable to me, and I really think that this is something you should consider doing. So Maybe a year or so later, I had the opportunity to go back to California. I had moved away uh, at that time. And I went to into Watts with two gang members, one previous gang member. I just want to put a pin in that. You went into Watts with two gang members. Yes. So that's not just trust one way. That's trust both ways. That's a good point. Yes. One previous gang member, one current gang member. I misspoke. And so after that, after what we were doing there, we went out to lunch. And so I told these guys about this phone call with this attorney. The current gang member, real hardcore guy, looked at me and he goes, you should do it. And I said, really? He said, yes. From everything that we've talked about today, because we hung out for the whole day. He said, you know a lot more about this. You know as much about a gang without being in a gang as anybody I ever met. That was kind of the way he said it to me. So I felt like I had his blessing, and because I had his blessing, I said, okay. So then I got a call right after that from another indigent defense system. I said I would help them. And then working as an expert in criminal cases kind of took off from there. So I think my question is, how did you help? Right. So when I work as a, as a gang expert, it depends on the case. I've worked in federal cases, state cases, criminal, civil, habeas, and immigration cases. So sometimes I might just write a report. If it's an immigration case, I usually write a very extensive report about the individual, and I look at all the evidence that's provided to me, and I write an opinion about whether this person is or is not in a gang and how them staying in the United States or leaving the United States could help or hurt them. If I'm testifying in a criminal matter, I'm looking at all the evidence that's been given to me. So I'm not saying what they want me to say. If they're focusing on, for example, is this a gang or not? Then I'm giving them my opinion on that. 
if they're focusing on what was the mentality of my client when they went and committed XYZ crime, I'm giving them my opinion on that. If they are, if it's a RICO case, then the focus is, is this an enterprise? Because some gangs become enterprises, but not all enterprises are gangs. Then I explain that and explain that to the jury. It helps the case because it educates the jury about how gangs operate, why they operate that way, why the individual may have done or said something they did or said. It helps to explain it to the jury so that the jury can make a better decision about whatever their charge is when it comes time for them to deliberate. How do gangs recruit? That's a really good question. How, how do gangs recruit? I'm going to answer that question, but first I need to say it depends on the gang. They all do not operate the same. So some gangs bless people in. And what that means is I'm a gang member. I see you. I like you. I want you in my gang. I'm just going to say, hey, come with us and I'm going to take you under my wing and I'm going to teach you our ways. They can also jump you in, which means that you have to fight the gang members in the gang you want to join. And there's different reasons they do that for X number of minutes. Then there's also being sexed into a gang. And this happens mostly to females where you have to have sex with either one person, but usually multiple people in the gang. And then they light you in. And then there's a coercive factor. So let me talk about that for a minute. Oh, I, let me go back for a second. There's also being born into a gang. So multi-generational games, people are born into them. And then let's get to this coercive factor. Let's say I want to join the XYZ gang. And they say to me, okay, in order to join us, you need to go commit a drive-by. Right. They might tell me who I need to go drive-by on. You need to go commit a drive-by on John Doe. And if you hit him, and if you get him, we're going to let you in the gang. If you kill him, we're going to let you in the gang. The directions are different depending on what's happening and who the gang is. So now let's say I go do that and now I don't become a member of the XYZ gang. Here's where the coercion comes in. The gang now knows who I shot, when I shot them, where I shot them. They might even have video on their cell phones of me shooting them. Right. And so now if I want to leave the XYZ gang in the future, they say, oh, no, you can't leave us. And I might say, but, you know, I really need to because of XYZ reasons. And they say, "Uh, -uh you can't leave us. And if you try, we're going to make sure that the police know that you're the one who committed that crime. And they have different ways of doing that other than just walking to, into a police station and telling the police. So that's where that coerce, coercion comes in. And I think many want to be gang members, never even consider, I'm doing this criminal activity, and if it's heinous enough, the gang itself could use this against me. Well, it's very interesting because that is classic Scientology and cult tactics. Mm -hmm. And it's used for online exploitation as well, where compromising photos are taken by young girls and then used against them to force them into activities they don't want to do. Yes. So this definitely is a tactic. Mm -hmm. So I read this study that just came out and it talks about how women in gangs are really just ignored in terms of being studied, um, at least in the UK. So a woman in a gang can be someone who makes money, brings in money, and they have a higher status. Or you can be a woman that comes in as a deficit, and therefore you have lower status. 
And that's consistent with what you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. So women who have sex to join a gang, they almost come in at a deficit. Because they're not adding money, they're not creating business, they're not bringing in business. What's your thought on that? Sometimes they're not, and sometimes they are. Sometimes they're used kind of as mules to move the drugs from one place to another. And that's exactly what this study said. It said in those beachside British towns, you know, like all those Masterpiece Theater episodes, that that's how they're moving the drugs in through the women. I was going to say yes, because think about it. If they're moving the drugs and they get arrested, who does the time? Not the yeah. male gang member, the woman carrying the drugs. So they're being used. Right. They're being used for sex. They might be used to uh, go into prisons and meet with other gang members that are inside the prison and deliver messages. But, you know, women in gangs do make money, too. There's women in gangs who are, like, running their own criminal enterprises. There's women in gangs who are maybe very good with finances. Really? Yeah. They keep track of, like, all the finances of the gang and, and kind of, like, money launder for the gang. So, as you said, it goes back to what is the skill that this woman has that she can bring to the gang or how can they use her, right, to meet their ends of what they want to do? This brings up an interesting issue for me. With gang enterprises, is it all about the money? Because, you know, in cults, it's not always all about the money. The government oftentimes, to uh, win their case, will focus on that. But it isn't always about the money. It can be about transporting guns between state lines. Well, that's about money. Transporting guns is about money. I mean, you're either selling it, buying it. Or you're using it to kill someone. Which is about money. I mean, it's about money and territory, don't you think? No. Really? No. If you're using weapons, do you want me to answer that question or go back to your previous? Dude, this is free form. Okay. You know, just let it out. So if you're using weapons to kill right. someone, there's a number of different reasons you're doing that. It can be because it's a financial transaction that went bad. So yes, it's about money. It can also be about revenge. You killed one of ours. So we're going to kill one of yours. Nothing to do with money. It can also be a respect factor. If trying to make ourselves be known in the area, the more people we shoot who are consider our opposition or our ops, right? The more people we shoot, that makes us feared more in the street respected more. So it's not always about money. So so it's about status. Yes, it can be. So sometimes they're moving money. Sometimes they're moving drugs across state lines. Sometimes they're uh, moving stolen cars as, across state lines. And sometimes human trafficking oh, yeah. ends up being about money. But it's not always 100% about money. It can also be personal. So let's say, for example, I'm in a gang. Right. And uh, my little brother is in the same gang with me. And the opposing gang shoots and kills my little brother. Okay, now it's personal. Right. This isn't just a gang thing now. This is personal. Right. So now I'm going to go over to the other side, and I'm going to kill either the person who killed my brother. And if I can't get that person, I'm going to get any of them and as many of them as I can. Because now it's personal payback. Alexandra Stein writes about coercive control. Mm -hmm. And I've been like stalking her, trying to get her on my podcast. Yeah. But she talks about high control groups. Mm -hmm. And how isolation 
from the outside、mm -hmm. is a part of it. There was something very interesting.、Um, I was in a sorority very briefly, and let's just say it didn't work out too well. But I was in a sorority. I noticed how they were in their own world. So I'm in the cafeteria one day, and I notice someone who's also in a sorority. And she looks around. The place is packed, and she says, "Nobody's here because nobody else from fraternity or sorority life was there." So I I think that would be a smaller version, and I think that's a smaller version of what happens in cults. I mean, you enter, and it becomes your entire world. So, how does that work with gangs? It depends on the gang, and it depends on your status within that gang. If you're very low down on the totem pole, that's not going to happen so much. Really? If you are higher in the middle or higher on the totem pole, that's going to definitely happen. And if this is a very hardcore gang. If this is a very hardcore criminal gang, and you are high up on the totem pole, your whole life is going to become gang. You are actually going to respect and revere the gang more than your own biological family. The gang will come first before everything else. It's going to come、right. before your children. It's going to come before your family members. If you are a group of young people who grew up together, and you commit criminal acts together, and you have an identifying name, sign or symbol, and you meet the criteria to legally be called a gang, but you're really like doing small time criminal activity, that's not going to be the case. Your family is going to come first. But in a, in gangs like、uh, MS13, that gang and everybody in that gang is coming first, above and, and beyond everyone else. Yeah, recently there was an arrest in Mexico. I'm sure you read about that, and they killed 26 people so far because they don't want El Chapo's kid to get extradited.、Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about not putting your family first. Your whole thought process changes too. If you're in a very hardcore gang and you're up in the ranks, let's say you're a leader or you're what, an OG, an original gangster, or a double OG, right? And you're really calling shots and running the show. Your whole mentality is around gang activity. It's around the perception of not only yourself but the gang. How you're perceived by your own gang members because they have to revere you and follow your directions. The opposing gang, you're very cognizant of how you appear to the opposing gang, and so your whole mentality is kind of about propping up, keeping this really image going. Yeah, I imagine so. Yeah, I imagine that could be true with a lot of groups. I mean, you have a group of warlords or a group of revolutionaries. I think that would be the、um, the rules of organized violence. Did I hear you say that you think that、uh, gang members have to fear their the leader of their gang? Well, okay, you know what? I'm just throwing it out there. You're the expert. Let's hear it. Okay. All gangs don't have leaders, so some gangs have a horizontal structure where everyone is pretty much equal. Other gangs have a vertical structure. So, if it is a vertical structure, like the gangster disciples or the Latin kings, there's rules, laws, different things you must follow, and remember. Remember how I talked about when they get you in the gang, they get you to commit a crime, and then later, you know, they can use that against you in a coercive way. Well, if you're not following the rules, if you're not doing what we're telling you to do, if you're too cocky and you want to run out there on your own and do your own thing, we're going to put you in line. 
And when we put you in line, that can be many different things. You can be physically assaulted by us. You can be fined money by us. You can be killed by us. So the repercussions are wide, but they can be extremely serious including the loss of not only your life as the gang member, but your family. They really want to get to you. They'll let you live. They'll let you go. And they'll go kill your wife and your kid. Then they'll come for you later. It all depends on what type of gang it is that we're talking about, how they're structured, and then how long they've been around and how well they've developed their method of operation. Some of these gangs operate like Fortune 500 companies. It's amazing. You know, they have board meetings and chairman of the board and they report up a chain of command, very much like the military. So, you know, I think because there's repercussions, you know this. And that's in the back of your mind. I better toe the line. So that's interesting. It's the institutional fear or the institutional punishment structure that can keep people in line, not just fear of the leader. Like a warlord. A warlord, it would be fear of the leader. But they've got this whole infrastructure set up. Absolutely. And that's a very good, that's very good verbiage for that, to describe that. Okay. Now let's talk getting out. Getting out? Yeah. I mean, how do they get out? Because we know they do. Yes. It depends on the gang. Some gangs you can get out of, and you can get out of rather easily. You know, they find that most gang members join a gang, and they only stay in the gang for a year and a half to two years, and then they get out, and nothing happens to them. The, the media doesn't tell us about that, right? So let me talk a little bit about that first. A lot of young people join gangs. Right. And by young people, I'm talking 10 years old to 18 years old. And they may be joining for protection from other people. Think of this. If you live in a very, very urban area, parts of Chicago, for example, you literally can't walk from your house to school without gang members assaulting you, shaking you down for money, you know, all kinds of things. So you might join a gang just so you have protection, so you can get from here to there. So that's a a pretty innocent reason for joining, and many people join for that reason. Some people join to be accepted. They want to feel part of a family because oftentimes we find that gang members have very dysfunctional families. And so they want to feel like they're part of a cohesive unit, and they find that in that. They might join for a sense of identity. They might join peer pressure, where they're being, you know, pressured into joining a gang. They also might join for the perceived rewards. There's uh, something that occurred to me when you talk about. So when you talk about drug dealers, I, I've read that a lot of them make basically minimum wage, like the guys you see on the street. If you look at the economics of drug dealers, there's like one guy making six figures. I'm not sure I'm following that. Okay, uh, this guy, I guess in the 2000s, did a study on the economics of drug dealers, and he talked about how really they live in their mother's basements for the most part, and they, they don't really make a lot of money. And that it's really like buying a lottery ticket. Just, it's a chance at making more money. What do you think about that? I don't agree with that. Okay, good. I want to hear that. I think, again, if you're a street soldier or if on the lower level, you're, you don't have that much information about the game. They're using you just to run drugs on the street. You don't know that much. You belong to them but you're not privy to a lot of information. You're a low level gang member. That person's not making hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, but for them, they're making a lot of money. Oh, okay. Think about it. 
If you're a 16 year old kid, number one, where can you go work? In this day and age, pretty much nowhere. If you're able to find a minimum wage job, you're bringing home like 150 a week if, if you're lucky. If you're selling drugs as a low level drug dealer, you should be bringing in at least, at least, if you're bad at it, $500 a week. That's a lot more than if you went and worked at Walmart. I so see. it's it's perception, right? For that 16-year-old, $500 a week is a lot of money. I see. Right? Let's talk about the people above him. Those people are making thousands of dollars a day. All right. Because he's bringing them the money and they are paying him his cut. So do you right. think they're giving him all the money? No. So they're making thousands of dollars a day, right? Go above them, those people could be making like 500,000 in a week, a million in a week. It all depends on how much weight they're able to move on the street. If they've got three guys working for them, they're not moving a lot of weight. Been able to take control of the whole city. They're they're moving tons of weight, and and the people up the chain, they're making really good money. They're making more than you and me. I can tell you. Yeah, don't rub it in. I know. And I wanted to talk a little bit about getting out when you're mid or upper level. Oh, that's right. that's what you asked me. So if you're the low level guy, you don't know that much, so you're not a liability. So let's say you go to the gang and you say, you know what? I got accepted to college. I'm going to go away to college. Nine times out of 10, they're going to say, good, go. And when you go there, scope it out and see if we can set up shop there. Some guys get out when they get a little bit older, because remember I said you only, most gang members only stay in for a year and a half to two years. And so usually how they get out, they kind of fade out. Like they start hanging, they stop hanging out with the gang as much. They might get married. They might have children. They actually might get a full-time job at a legitimate work. And they kind of fade away. And then they go to the gang and they say, you know what? My heart is going to always be with you. I'll always be XYZ gang till I die. But I can't be out there committing crimes anymore and doing drive-bys because I've got like three little kids now. I can't do that anymore, and I, I just can't be involved. And usually the gang will say, sure, we understand, you know? And they'll say, you know, stick around, and we'll we'll use you and need you for things that we need you for, you know, whatever that happens to be. That's probably most of the gangs in America. Then there's gangs you can't get out of because you know too much. You worked your way up the chain or into the inner circle. You know the information. You are now a liability. So if you try to leave us, we're going to kill you because you're going to expose us and we're not going to let you go. Or a gang like MS-13, you can't leave. No matter what. No matter what level. Yeah. Because a true MS-13 gang member. Because there's right. gangs out here calling themselves MS-13, and they're, and they're not. If you're a true MS-13 gang member, you're not leaving. And if you do, you probably won't be around very long, and we won't see you again. You know, I know it's a complex answer, but it all depends on what the gang is and then who you are in this gang to these people. So what about taking down gangs? What's the approach? Put them all in jail? So usually what happens first is the gang is surveyed, usually by ATF, FBI, local police, over time. And video is taken over time. Phone calls are monitored over time. And the gang might not be aware any of this is even happening. And then usually there's a sweep. It's usually a gang task force that'll come in and arrest a whole bunch of people at once, 20, 30, 40 people. They all got arrested, and now they're tied up sitting in jail waiting. Some of these guys won't be able to have a cash bond. 
So they have to sit there two, three years till they go to trial. So that right there is a method in and of itself because now they're off the street. So now they just uh, really kind of chop this gang at their knees because this gang can't operate as well as they were out on the street. The next thing they do is form a RICO case against them. So they go and look at multiple crimes that have been committed by multiples of these people in the gang and put them all together into a RICO case. This is an enterprise. Now, not only does extra time come, if they go to trial and they get found guilty, extra time comes with that to the sentence. And so instead of John Doe going to prison for seven years for a crime, he's now going to prison for 50 years for that same crime. We got put into a RICO case. So that inspires people to turn state's evidence. Yes. CIs. Snitches. There are some states, a cooperative, a CI giving evidence isn't, a CI giving a statement is not admissible. It's not considered real evidence. A CI making statements to the police, it can be used in a trial, but it's not considered actual evidence. Then there's other states where you don't need any evidence at all. If you have a CI saying something, that's all you need. Each state runs a little bit differently, and I'm not an attorney, so I can't get into the specifics of Because a lot of times when I am hired, I'm hired by attorneys in all different states. Sometimes I'll say to the attorney, tell me about your case. And then I'll start asking, does the government have the following evidence? And I ask for very specific things. And they say no, and they don't need it because they've got two snitches saying X, Y, Z. And I'm like, but where is the forensic evidence? The attorney will say to me, Well, in this state, in this jurisdiction, you don't need it. That is shocking and horrifying to me. Well, it's just all the people on death row who've been exonerated. And the podcast serial that started it all and really got everyone to take a look at the abuse of process that lands people in jail for over 20 years. So let me explain to you why that attorney might hire me. That attorney would hire me to refute what these CIs are saying. However, they also, once they get me on the stand to refute what these CIs are saying now, I'm there. They can start asking me all kinds of questions. So now they can get me to educate the jury about how this particular gang operates, why they operate that way, and why what the CIs are saying probably did not ever happen. So going back to coercive control, if you look at the standard model of cults, there are similarities between cults and gangs, but, but in gangs, it really isn't about brainwashing. It's not about dietary restrictions, controlling their thoughts, sleep deprivation. Is that true? It's not about worshiping the leader. A cult is about worshiping the leader. A gang is about living the ideology, the culture of the gang. Gangs don't tell you anything like don't read newspapers or the internet, right? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, um, information control is part of the bite model of cult assessment. And it seems like gangs don't really have that. So it seems while there's a lot of similarities between cults and gangs, there's some really key differences that, um, because when you read about course of control, they do include gangs, but it really is not a true cult model. And I think uh, me and my 25 listeners will uh, find that very interesting. (laughs) Well, good. I'm glad. Can Can I just add something here? In the media, 
we're hearing about criminal games. Not all games are criminal games. Not all games are entrepreneurial games. Some games are kind of what's called social games, where they really exist for social reasons. And I don't mean social reasons like how people might go to the Elks Club. They're, you know, a group of people, usually young people, who grew up in a neighborhood. They all know each other. They're friends. In elementary school and in middle school, they start doing knucklehead kind of low-level criminal activity. They're not thinking, oh, let's go be a gang, right? And they're not aware what legally makes them a gang. So oftentimes they are existing just for social reasons. We like each other. We hang out. We go get high. We, you know, go pick up girls. It's for social reasons. Then what happens due to their own ignorance, the police look at this and say, wait a minute, this fits the legal criteria of a gang. So they all go get arrested and now they're gang members. Really? Yes. I used to work in middle schools, elementary schools, and I would see this very frequently. You know, and I'd step in and I'd tell these guys, wait a minute. Do you realize you now have an identifying sign, symbol, or name? There's three or more of you. And they might have just gone and done some knucklehead crime. Like, um, I had a kid once. He took the, this is before they made key fobs. He took the car keys of a teacher off the teacher's desk during the class, and he ran out into the parking lot, and I don't know what this is called, the little remote thing you press and you make the the horn go (laughs) on the car. He presses that, he finds the dude's car, he gets in the car, he goes for a joyride, and he brings it back. That's a knucklehead stupid thing to go do, but he brought the car back. But was it a crime? Yes. And now, you know, depending on who he's associating with and how many of them do that, and if they have an identifying sign, symbol, or name, they can, become, they can be labeled as gang members. They're not thinking they're gang members. They're just, we're doing crazy stuff. We're friends doing crazy stuff. <laughs> That is really informative, and I can really see the differentiation now between gangs, cults, and conspiracies a lot better. Thank you. Well, good. I'm glad that this conversation was helpful. Yeah, I'm just like this roving philosopher who's total amateur. I've read books, and I use this podcast to just talk to people who are interesting or interest me. My last or second to last um, podcast was with this guy who didn't think there was a such thing as brainwashing. And um, I look like an idiot because he was very educated and I'm not. But um, I'm not afraid of looking like an idiot. And that's the joy of having your own podcast. Thank you. And Christine, if anybody wants to visit my website, it's gangcolors.com. And so, everyone, that was our podcast for this week. It was a great learning experience for me. Um, I hope it was for you. And I just have to apologize. I know the sound was insane. I had to dub in my responses because they were basically unintelligible because whatever. I don't know. Sometimes technology works and sometimes it doesn't.